Bienvenue, I'm Mil with Picard, and welcome to a rather overcast and cloudy, but still very beautiful, Le Mazin, France. Today, I want to talk about first cars, because the other day I was having a conversation with a friend of mine about first cars, and we were, we were talking about our first cars and, and our first driving experiences and that kind of thing, as you do with your friends. And... I thought I'll just look up what first cars are today because I've, I've got a young nephew that's going to be driving for the first time in a minute and I wondered like what what are the new cars that he could have today so I did a google search on my phone for best new cars 2019 a popular automotive magazine had ranked the best little tiny hatchback things and they had a joint first place the see it me at 12,210 euros for the base model. The Skoda Citigo at 9,500 euros for the base model. And the VW up at 10,950. Yeah. 10,950, 12,210, and 9,500 euros. Who has that sort of money? What 17 year old has 12 grand in their piggy bank? I know I didn't at 17. I'm sure those cars will be very reliable at doing car things. But they're all the same car underneath. That's why they were joint first place. All three cars are the same car, just with a different set of plastic bodywork on the top, which is really, really boring. It's like saying your option is fish. So I think I can do better. So I created a list of requirements that I think any car for a young automotive enthusiast needs to meet. It needs to be cheap on tax, it needs to be cheap on insurance, it needs to keep up with modern traffic and it needs to be economical so that you can actually afford to put fuel in it and use it. I think a young 16 or 17 year old kid with a summer job can reasonably make five grand over the summer. So that was my goal. 5,000 euros or less. If it's less, even better. It needs to be reliable, it needs cheap parts availability, it needs to be easy to work on and easy to modify because if a young kid can learn to work on their own car, in my opinion, they can learn to service it, they can learn to modify it, they can learn to do stuff with it. That's a valuable life skill and that's something that a new car won't teach you. But also, in my opinion, I think that if you work on something and you make something nice with your own bare hands, you're more likely to look after it and you're less likely to wrap it around a tree, which for a 16, 17 year old kid is vitally, vitally important. Because this YouTube channel obviously is on YouTube, on the internet, and you guys watch these videos all over the world, it, there's no point in me choosing cars that you can only buy in France or that you can only buy in the UK. So I've tried to choose cars that are available in a bunch of different markets all around the world. And I wanted to choose cars that would allow a young kid to have like awesome life experiences that would help them do cool things and meet cool people that had cool clubs around them or allowed you to do something that you wouldn't be able to do with just your normal little car. And as you can imagine, that list narrowed the field down by a lot. There are many cars that I thought would make brilliant first cars for a young person, but didn't meet the requirements, one or two requirements on the list, or I already had a car on my list that did the same thing better and cheaper. So before we get into the big five, here are my list of honorable mentions. Cars that are good, in fact, some of my favourite cars are in this list, but they didn't quite meet the criteria. The Renault 4L van, the Austin 7, the Simca 6, the Mini 1000, the Morris Minor, the A35, the Fiat 850, the Hillman Imp, the K70 Toyota Corolla, and the Series 2 Land Rover. We're also excluding from this list cars that I think are a little bit cliche, even though they're very good, such as the EF Civic and the Peugeot 205. So now we've got all that out of the way, it's time for the big five. And the first of the big five 
is for all the people out there that want something rough, rugged, that they can take overlanding or off-roading. It's the little, tiny, badass four-wheel drive that could. The Suzuki SJ, or Jiminy, or Samurai, or whatever it's called in your place in the world. In America, it's sold as a Chevy, and in Australia, I think it's sold as a Holden. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's an SJ. And we're currently on our fourth generation of SJ. You can buy one brand new if you wanted to. But my choice would be the second gen. The first gen, it's all right, but they're a bit fragile. Parts are kind of hard to get. And they're all right. But the second gen is truly badass. They're available as a one liter or a 1.3 with a four or a five speed manual. And they are, above all things, small, easy to drive, and four wheel drive. You can buy a soft top, you can buy a hard top, you can have a clip on hard top. A hard top will be cheaper on your insurance. And you can put little cool alloy wheels on it, and you can put some chunky tires on it, and you can take it off-roading, and you can do awesome, awesome, awesome things with it. The next car on our list is another Suzuki, believe it or not, because Japanese cars, on a whole, and massively overlooked in the classic car world. And this particular car might be the most overlooked because it's currently on its 11th generation. Bad cars do not make it to 11. <laughs> Bad cars die off at one or die off at two. They don't make it all the way to 11 and last all this time unless they have a die-hard following. The car I'm talking about is the Suzuki Super Carry. Now the Suzuki Super Carry has been sold as a Bedford Rascal. It's been sold as a bunch of things, including a Daihatsu and all sorts. In fact, it's the only car in history that has won both a Ford and Chevy badge. How's that for a piece of car trivia for you? But my particular choice would be the eighth gen, and I would choose a panel van, a windowless van. And the reason is, vans are one of the cheapest cars that a young car enthusiast can actually have. Because they're a work vehicle. And good, cheap insurance is everything when you're 16 or 17. And the other reason I would choose a van is because vans are one of the most versatile vehicles money can buy. Literally. You can shove all your stuff in it. You can put bikes in it. You can put surfboards in it. In fact, if you are so inclined, you might be able to find a tiny camper, although a tiny camper will be more expensive to insure. You can put a roof rack on top of it and some little badass alloy wheels and some surfboards and turn it into like the world's cheapest, coolest little surf bus. And if you come to France on your summer holidays in your badass little surf bus, there are free places for camper vans in France, in every single town where you can stop for free. So rather than spending like two weeks in Ibiza that you probably won't even remember, let's face it, you could actually come to France and spend all summer learning to surf or mountain biking in the Alps or doing awesome things that you will remember for the rest of your life. And you don't have to just do it once. And because it's a one litre five speed, it's super economical to run. And it's mid-engined. The engine is actually behind you. And if you don't believe me that these cars are cool, go on Google and type in Suzuki Carry Modified or Suzuki Carry Japan. In Japan, these cars have a massive community and they put super cool little wheels on them and they slam them on the ground and they do badass, badass things with them. So like I said, don't take my word for it. Go and check them out. The third car on this list is a Citroen, and it's a 2CV. I had to fit one in this list somewhere because they are so good. I was very tempted to go for the Diane 4, which is the 435cc Diane. Smaller engine, cheaper insurance, and cheaper to buy. But there is a 2CV that does it better, and that is the AK250 which is a 435cc van. Yes, it has square headlights, but it is a proper 2CV, and those headlights can be changed if you don't like them with just two bolts. So that's not really an issue. 
and from 1977 they have three-point seat belts which if that's a requirement for your parents look for one after 1977. It has 26 horsepower and a top speed of 95 kilometers an hour which is just under 60 but it'll cruise at 50 miles an hour all day long the same as the other cars on this list you're not going to be going much faster than 50 miles an hour but that's a good thing because you're not going to be getting speeding tickets on motorways and it's not super fast but at the same time you can still get where you're going and it's about as fast as my 2cv jolene they're good on road they're good off road they're fantastic little drivers cars people drive them across europe people drive them across africa they're a tough little thing every single panel and part is available for them and they're six volt so if you wanted to do a 602 or a 652 engine conversion if your laws allow you can do that you can put electronic ignition on them there's a ton of stuff you can do with them that's awesome and make them more powerful and a bit quicker and run smoother and be super fuel economic if that's what you're into do whatever you want with it they're awesome now then onto our fourth car and this one's a bit odd so you'll have to trust me the Volvo DAF 66. DAF was a Dutch company that made a car called the 66. They made a bunch of others before it, but they, their last car was the 66. And then they were bought by Volvo. And Volvo produced the 66 under their own name. But what it basically is, is a small front-engined rear-wheel drive car. Sounds good. And they have a 1.1 or a 1.3 litre Renault engine, the Cleon Fort which was sold in the Renault 12 and a bunch of other stuff, including like the Mark 1 Twingo, they put it in vans. That, that engine has been in everything and all parts for it are available. So that's good. You don't have to pay expensive Volvo parts prices. But anyone who knows what a DAF is will tell you, it has what's called a variomatic gearbox. It isn't, unfortunately, a manual. It's a weird kind of automatic. It works in the same way as like a rev and go moped. You put your foot down and it goes. There's no kind of gearbox or changing gears or anything like that. And the good news is if you're in a wheelchair and you have to use hand controls to drive a car, this is one of the few classic first cars that you can have that you can actually drive with hand controls. You can put hand controls on it and you can drive that car. You don't have to be discriminated against or left out because you can't find a cool classic first car. The Volvo DAF 66 is awesome. And weirdly, for an automatic, it was incredibly good at rallying. And they used the same engine and gearbox combination in a Formula racing car and won with it. And the reason is that that gearbox driving the rear wheels works as a limited slip differential. Yes, this is one of the only cars that you can have that's front-engined, rear-wheel drive, and has a limited slip diff. I'll let that sink in for a second. It was designed by Michelotti, who also designed things like Ferraris and Maseratis. It has side impact bars and disc brakes, so your mum will love it because you're driving a Volvo that has side impact bars and disc brakes, and so will your insurance company. Now. DAF built it as a coupe as well as a saloon and an estate so you could actually have a coupe that's front engined that's rear wheel drive and has a limited slip diff as your first car but that wouldn't be my choice my choice would be the combi or estate version which isn't really an estate it's like a two door big hatchback I would have a 1.3 Volvo 66 combi gl which is the luxury one that has alloy wheels it has a massive boot so you can shove all your stuff in it they're really cool looking like i say alloy wheels nice interior nice seats and the volvo has something that the daft doesn't and that is when you park it up it actually has a park mode in the gearbox like a, a modern automatic does so that's a, an added safety feature and they've got like big safety bumpers on them but they're still really cool looking and best of all being bolted together by Volvo there's a lot of them still left so if you look carefully you might be able to find a really good low mileage example that's been taken care of by some old lady somewhere 
for a lot less than five grand. Now then, on to our fifth and final car, the Fiat 126. What is a Fiat 126? If you've never seen one before, it's the thing that replaced the Nuva Fiat 500, which is the car everyone thinks of when they think of like the classic Fiat 500. And they are cool, they are like designed with a ruler, they are the modern version of the classic Fiat 500, and they are massively underappreciated. It's basically a more modern and better version of the classic Fiat 500. It's still rear-engined, it's still rear-wheel drive, and it's still air-cooled. They were available in 594cc, they were available in 652cc, and they were available in 704cc. The last of those had 26 horsepower, the same as the AK250 van. And if you look on YouTube, you'll find Fiat 126s doing all kinds of mental stuff because they make one heck of a rally car and they're basically the official car of Poland. Poland has adopted the, the little Fiat 126 as their car, it's their national car like France and the 2CV or Britain and the Mini or America and the Mustang. The Fiat 126 or the Fiat Polski is Poland's answer to the people's car and my god they love it and of course they made millions of them production started in 1972 and ended for fiat in 1993 but in poland production ended in the year 2000 that's how much they love it they just couldn't get enough of it and because of that there's squillions of them they do rust but parts are available all mechanical parts are available, they're really easy to work on, and they're really tiny. So if you need a city car that you can fit four people in, that's still rear-wheel drive, that's still, you know, manual gearbox, they're brilliant. And I especially like the Campagnolo alloys that used to come on the R-Bath versions, which are now remade by Compomotive in the UK. So you can actually get a brand new set of, uh, of our bath Campagnolo alloy wheels for your little 126, super, super cool. Anyway, that's my list of five awesome cars that you can have as your first car if you're a young automotive enthusiast or you can buy for your kids if you're looking for something that's better than an Econo box or something that's less cliche than another Fiesta. Um, I tried to put this list together of, of stuff that I would buy for my kid and that I would want if I was a kid. They're not the obvious choices, but I think they are some of the best ones. Thank you for liking and subscribing. Down in the comments this week, I want you to tell me what your first car was. Or, if you were a young kid looking for your first car, what do you want as your first car? What would be your pick? Another thing is, a bunch of you have told me that you want to share your pictures and your cars with me on social media. And that's awesome. A bunch of you have added me in, uh, in pictures on Instagram and on Twitter. That's really, really cool. But I want to be able to share the cars, not just with me, but with our little community, because we are growing quite the little community here, and it's, it's awesome. I'm, I, I love it. So, instead of adding me and put, putting at the Oliver Picard on, on your social media, put hashtag the Oliver Picard. And if we all follow hashtag the Oliver Picard on Instagram and on Twitter, then we can all share our cool car photos and the stuff we've seen in the street but also our projects and stuff that we're working on together with each other and that helps grow the community so with that thank you for watching please be awesome to each other and i'll see you all in the next one bye bye